Welcome to Christ Church. Momentarily, the Good Friday liturgy will begin. And to facilitate your full participation uh, online with us, you could have a Bible at the ready, you could have your prayer book nearby. You could also go to our website. There's a script that's been created that includes the entire Good Friday liturgy. All the prayers, the responses, the, the, the lessons, the scripture lessons. You could open another screen on your tablet or your computer and have it side by side with the video, or you could print it out. You've got a few moments to do that. Feel free to go and, and make plans for that if you haven't already. Also, if you have friends who may not know that we're streaming momentarily, text them right now. Text them and let them know we're, we're about to begin the Good Friday Liturgy at Christ Church Cathedral. Other notes very quickly. There'll be no announcements in this liturgy. The solemnity carries us through right to the very end and the final prayer, but do plan to linger just after the clergy has left. There's a, a little surprise montage of the community that you may want to linger to enjoy. Finally, your clergy have been helping numerous people in the parish and outside of the parish who's whose lives have been uh, deeply affected by either the tornado or by uh, the sickness. Uh, we have parishioners who've lost jobs, uh, parishioners who've had damage to their homes. And we just want to say directly to all of you, if you or someone you know needs assistance with a light bill, something that helps them get through the month, a bag of groceries, please contact a member of the clergy you may do so by finding any of our email addresses on the website. Peace. Blessed be our God. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. The psalm between the lessons this morning is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me and are so far from my cry and from the words of my distress? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted you, and you delivered them. They cried out to you, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my brother's mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. But not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me like a ravening and roaring lion. 
I am poured out like water. All my bo bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a pod shared. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you have laid me out in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them, but when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord, he rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down and worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who, in every respect, has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. 
Again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let those men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave to me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was also the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went out with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting 
to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove, wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There, they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. 
Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. 
Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Amen. Well, we've made it back. It's Good Friday, back to this very place. Back, we made our way back to Calvary. We walked with him triumphantly into Zion, lived with him through his last days, broke bread with him at the Last Supper, received the mandatum novum, were separated from him at his arrest, and now, now we've ascended the great hill outside the city to watch and wait and grieve and despair. Someone asks, was it all in vain? Vanity of vanities, an empty plot without direction that ends with the ambivalent vassal Pilate as a reluctant victor? Making sense of it all has required those inside and outside the tradition to theorize. Perhaps you conclude this day was occasioned by the misguided steps of an innocent, too naive to negotiate the halls of power. Perhaps you think this day to be little more than a morality play on the excesses associated with the deployment of unchecked Roman military might. Perhaps your way through this day this Good Friday comes by some notion that God begins to appreciate your suffering through the suffering of His Son. Is that right? Sometimes the preacher's focus on the suffering of Jesus is so directed as to suggest Jesus is one of us. And, and be, because he's one of us, God gets us in a way that otherwise he could not. How, how anthropocentric of the preacher. Sometimes the preacher focuses on the tragedy of it all, laboring to draw you out of your day-to-day -day and ever more deeply into the unfolding first-century drama. In this way, you could feature the preacher as, as narrator for the musical, Jesus Christ Superstar. It, do you see, it, it's speculation like this that, that tempts the latter-day Christian skeptic and preacher all to negotiate away the scandal otherwise insisted on by the cross and passion of our Lord. Our God dies the most humiliating of deaths, an identity eradicating death in the effort to save you and me from the path of self-destruction set out by our first parents. It may be especially tempting under the current circumstances to identify with the suffering of Christ on the cross. Stopping just short of the voyeurism encouraged by Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, you might place the current crisis and struggle of your life, the struggle of your family, the, the crisis of the nation, of the world, this plague and its path of destruction, we might place it on the shoulders of Christ and watch him respond as an empath. The dying God begins to feel what you feel, though 
seemingly without an inclination to act. His agony and bloody sweat, as the great litany refers to it, mustn't be forgotten. But, but Christ did not go to the cross to suffer on our behalf. He dies for us. See how God shows his love for us, writes Paul in the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. See how God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were still in rebellion, Christ died for us. So please don't characterize his death as an accident or a freak moment in history, an unintentional blunder by disciples and prophet alike, or as an incident to teach God something he didn't know already. Either our God in Christ dies to save, or he died in vain. And I refuse to toss the passion narrative on the scrap heap of history otherwise littered with the myths of God-humans who die and rise to attain the status of talisman or manipulators of fate. Notice, Jesus also doesn't die in order that everything will be all right. That, that's a a Pollyannish interpretation of Christianity that the historic Eucharistic prayers work so hard to correct. As he dies a death occasioned by our rebellion, he teaches us of love, absorbing our sin as the Lamb of God and experiencing the full abandonment of God the Father. If crucifixion as a means of execution had been reserved by Rome for slaves, criminals, and traitors, and used to erase the memory of Jesus from the world, and if Jesus was abandoned by his people, then the Father's abandonment of the Son cannot surprise. It is the necessary consequence of the sinless one assuming our sin. This, this moment on the cross requires that abandonment, passion, and struggle. It required that these be essential components of the mandatum novum's love. They're baked into the relationship of the Trinity from the very beginning. It's of the essence of God to show love in weakness, not strength, to abandon everything dear, precious, and known in order to love. Jesus' fourth word from the cross, it's a quote of Psalm 22. He says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's not a question seeking an answer, but rather a declaration of self-revelation. You will know my love insofar as I give up everything even my son, for you. The governor of New York has been in the unenviable position presiding over ground zero for the COVID suffering and crisis in the United States. He has alternately encouraged, chided, pleaded, and bargained, but always worked to pull his state through this crisis. Last week, however, he realized the cost of cheap encouragement. He's been telling his citizens, and he'll do so again, that they will get through this because they are New York tough. They are New York strong. But day before yesterday, he realized that the blithe rehearsal of death statistics were, were empty, were casual, and for many were hurtful. It finally caught up with him on Monday when, when he eventually had to admit that death, any death, 
that showed up in these statistics, the, the death was someone's tragic loss, a mother, a brother, a cousin, a spouse, a friend. Not everyone will make it through. The we in New York Strong won't include the one numbered in the death statistics. And besides, even the grave claims Lazarus a second time. No, Jesus didn't die to make everything all right. He died to save us, to save us from our sins, to save us from ourselves, and to show us the preposterous and tragic nature of love resulting in the Father's abandonment of the Son. This love laid bare in God's abandonment of Jesus is the love we are to own, to live, and to proclaim. Strangely, this element of abandonment, a characteristic of the Holy Trinity, it's also baked into our Eucharistic liturgies. When the celebrant says, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, she is referring to the Passover lamb that was ritually sacrificed for the forgiveness of sin preceding the Passover Seder. Jesus' death forgives our sins, saves us, and puts an end to ritual sacrifice. It also plainly displays abandonment of the dear, the familiar, and the cherished as essential components of love. I don't believe that the person at worship normally thinks of this when coming to the Eucharist. But in these times when we are deprived of Christ's Eucharistic presence, the experience of abandonment is front and center. This forced Eucharistic fast puts you and me in closer proximity with Christ's cry of dereliction. If these last four weeks have not gotten your attention spiritually, this apocalyptic experience of plague, then it, it's hard to know what will. Dame Julie and Julian of Norwich's All Will Be Well, or Paul's All Things Work Together for Good for Those Who Love the Lord, these are uttered from, from deep prayer lives that know the abandonment Christ experiences on the cross. If there's no way to the empty tomb except through Calvary, then there is no embrace of love as a defining ethic without experiencing the abandonment of God in Christ. We've been learning about this, you and I. We've been learning about this abandonment in this season of plague. Now, the grandfather doesn't get to hold his newborn granddaughter. Now, the expectant mother may not have her husband in the delivery room. Now, sons are not allowed to the bedsides of ailing fathers. Priests are discouraged and in some places refused access to the dying. P please don't tell me it doesn't make sense that God would abandon Jesus. I know this abandonment with full awareness. This Jesus will not be Messiah strong. He will die. He will experience the abandonment of God. See how God shows his love for us? In that while we were still rebels, sinners, Christ died for us. Show me, Lord, show me Christ's cry as no question, but a declaration of self-revelation. 
show me his cry as love. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? small 
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for John, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Let us kneel in silent prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Donald, the President of the United States. For Bill, the Governor of Tennessee. For John, the Mayor of Nashville. For the Congress and the Supreme Court. For the members and representatives of the United Nations for all who serve the common good, for first responders, doctors, nurses, hospital workers, lab technicians, and all those who are working for vaccines and cures for the coronavirus, that by God's help, they may lead us into that place characterized by healing, reconciliation, safety, and equity. Let us kneel in silent prayer.
arise. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind. For those who are hungry and those experiencing homelessness. Those who are destitute and those who are oppressed. For the sick, the wounded, and the crippled. for those whose lives have been turned upside down by the recent tornado and the spreading pandemic, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Let us kneel in silent prayer. Arise. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow and the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions, and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ. For those who have never heard the word of salvation. For those who have lost their faith. For those hardened by sin or indifference. For the contemptuous and scornful. For those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples. For those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others. That God will open our hearts to the truth and lead us to faith and obedience. Let us kneel in silent prayer.
Arise. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. Let us kneel in silent prayer. Arise. O God of unchangeable power and light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their per perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, oh, oh sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they 
sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, thy thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign one God now and forever. Amen. Oh, 
bleeding friends of life and peace. Come sinners, see your maker die and say, was ever grief like his? Come feel with me his blood applied. My Lord, my love is crucified. Say, was it? 